You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 238, Nevermore. Hosted by Dan Terry. General Death Metal reporting for duty. Jeff Kane. One hit wonder. And Joseph Wren. Let's go back to you with the boombox. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you invoke your divine intervention to face down the river dragon, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe, that is Dan, and that is Jeff. Guys, we're talking about Nevermore tonight. So much Nevermore, so little time. I I did not read up on the poem, so I'm kind of screwed here. No, that's the Raven. We're talking about the band Nevermore Ah. and their glorious semitone melodies that constantly flow through the entire discography. I'm going to get it right out of the way. Every joke Dan has ever made about what Sully is doing in Godsmack is nullified by this band. No. You keep telling yourself that, buddy. (laughs) No. That's because a superior musician wrote the music for Nevermore, and that's Jeff Loomis. Jeff Loomis was the man, is the man. Well, he was the man until he came to St. Louis and lost all his shit because it got stolen. How did I know they that was going to come up tonight? <laughs> <laughs> they caught the they caught the guy that was doing that. Two the of guys. them. Yeah. yeah, they were like storing all the all the equipment in like like abandoned homes, abandoned and houses. They were making, and down. Yeah, they were making Craigslist posts too. It's like, yeah, come buy all this gear that's totally not stolen. <laughs> <laughs> Then I yeah. guess the cop showed up to buy some mics or something and was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you guys you guys seem to have a lot of bass cabs. So what's going on with that? <laughs> Why does this one say nevermore on the side of it? I don't I don't understand. No, it was it was Jeff Loomis doing a solo tour. Oh well then he was totally screwed then. Yep. Man, this band really kind of snuck up on me and hit me over the head with the tire iron when I wasn't ready for it. You know, we've been doing more like 80 centric bands on the show lately. Like We've been doing, um, we've been doing like, uh, you know, we've been doing like Motley Crue. I don't know if that one's out yet or not, but uh, we're doing like Motley Crue, Def Leppard. Joe really wants to do Rat. I personally don't like Rat, but it is what it is, I guess. But, uh, you know, and we obviously with like Def Leppard and all that, but like. Winger, dude. I'm not doing Winger. You guys can do Winger. (laughs) Get out of my house. Dude was a ballet dancer before he became a. uh metal guy well <laughs> i'm serious i believe, I believe no i believe you i believe you 100 percent. just keep uh, giving us more reasons not to talk about winger jeff oh i will because it's fun but i kind of thought that nevermore was gonna be like kind of like that like not like an 80s band but just be like i really didn't know what i was expecting because like i remember being like 14 years old and it, i was listening to like liquid fm or what liquid metal or something like that and they were playing some songs. I was pro- I was probably trying to find like metalcore songs or like new metal songs. And this like nine and a half minute Nevermore song came on and it would never end. And I did not like it. And I turned it off and I was like, oh, God, screw that band. But I'll never have to hear them again. <laughs> then then here I am. So uh, welcome you know, to I, yeah. discography discussion. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's that's kind of where we're at uh, with Nevermore. So to say that they were much better than I was anticipating is a massive understatement. This is one of those bands that the elements were there that would be sampled by other bands like Fear Factory comes to mind. The baritone vocals that are very present later on in the discography with the melodic heavy guitars that are not thrash necessarily. But they have all those classic heavy metal tendencies. I think Nevermore is one of the best bands nobody listens to because outside of this group, I've never had anyone come to me and say, why aren't you listening to Nevermore? I know this band has fans. I know they are solid musicians. Dude can sing. So I'm glad we're talking about the band on this episode. Long overdue. Are we ready to get into it? Yeah, I was going to say, I've mentioned them... A few times back in the day, I I know I have, uh, because I'm a huge Jeff Loomis fan. I wonder why that is, Jeff. Yeah, well, besides the name. (laughs) uh, Oh, yeah. You know, Jeff, he's one of my favorites. Whoa, I don't know that that's going to stay on the show. (laughs) Mine too, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, no, not just because the dude's named Jeff. I mean, I like the dude because uh, you can't really define... You know, heavy metal is pretty much what you got to call him because uh, he tends to pull from 
tons of different genres. And that's why I like them. You really don't get bored listening to Nevermore because there's so much different shit going on. They never stay the same. The one thing I will say as World Dane gets further into his career, you kind of get a Cinderella feel. I mean, I do, vocally speaking. Oh, yeah, I can hear that for sure. So, I mean, I mean, talk about a, a fantastic person, you know, a fantastic man to emulate. But yeah, I mean, I, I like these guys. I've liked them for a long time. I actually started listening to them because it was like, oh, there's this heavy band in Seattle. And, you know, me and my Seattle roots when it comes to stuff like sub pop and all that kind of thing, you know, with the original emo if in the mid 90s. So I was looking for a lot to talk about emo anymore on the show. I I, I know. Okay, (laughs) that's fine. But I'm just saying that's how I got, you know, it was a progression for me because I liked that scene. I, I connected with it really well. And, you know, I was looking for stuff that was harder. That was you know, from the Seattle area that wasn't emo, wasn't punk, wasn't grunge. Well, you had Nevermore. And they started out with, you know, the power vocals for the first few albums. They're just kind of, eh, for me. But once he kind of, like, finds his sweet spot, you know, Nevermore is fucking jam, dude. And you're doing yourself a disservice if you haven't listened to him. Jeff is definitely an expert at finding people's sweet spots. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I can say that, uh, I was very, very, very surprised by this band because, you know, you said before we started rolling, they lacked description because normally I'm like, blah, 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 band was a metalcore band or blah, 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 band is a power metal band or a death metal band. And then Joe says, no, it's not a death metal band. It's a thrash metal band. And then we then we fight like cartoon characters. And all you see is like a whole bunch of dirt kicked up in different directions. Then then Brian Patton comes on the show and, you know, I say something is emo and he goes, no, it's metalcore. And we fight. Uh, Nevermore, you really can't get into those types of arguments because whereas I think that they basically are just a heavy metal band, they're not a heavy metal band in that they sound like Iron Maiden or that they sound like Black Sabbath. They play heavy metal and all the subgenres that come with it. <laughs> you know, except maybe black metal. I don't remember hearing a lot of black metal in there, but I mean, the, it has the... No, that, has, they, no, there were some, I mean, like tuning references, but that's about it. Fair enough. But no, um, not musically, but tuning, yes. But yeah, I think that like, I mean, they, they just, they run the gamut of doing like kind of a traditional heavy metal thing. A little bit, they, they kind of, especially the early stuff kind of leans a little heavier towards power metal. And, um, but they, yeah. they hit you with the aggression of thrash metal, the speed of death metal, the the absolute groove monster of groove metal. Like they've got all of it. They do it all. And the music is so heavy at times. It's it's weird hearing him continue to do his kind of uh, vibrato. Yeah, over those riffs because he could have literally just growled over the whole thing, and I would have yep. been fine with that. <laughs> well, yeah, when you're a meathead, we know this. Obviously, <laughs> no, he started growling, so now I can punch dudes. You know, but like, <laughs> I I think, that, uh, yeah, watch out for the fat guy in the hopes ball shirt. Uh, but I think that like. I think that I think that for the most part, Nevermore keeps it all together in a way that I think a lot of bands that are this diverse do not. And I think that that's I mean, don't get me wrong. They, they kind of go into some places they probably shouldn't sometimes. But like, I do think that like overall they keep it together because I've heard a lot of people describe them as a progressive metal band. But I don't think that they are progressive as much as they're extremely diverse. And there's a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the same thing. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's it's coming from a different angle, but like with BT Bam, I mean, they, there's so many different things that they that they encompass. And uh, I, I think that, you know, Nevermore, obviously it's not encompassing the same thing, but it's encompassing a lot. So I'm yeah. not trying to I'm not trying to compare them directly to BT Bam, but it is the same aspect of where, you know, BT Bam gets a, a label just because they do so many different things. And like, well, we can't really say they're this so we're you know we're just gonna say okay it's just that because that's the easiest answer right and it's always progressive progressive metal is like if you play a bunch of different genres you just kind of get like put in that that's just the way that it is and i don't agree with that but i i understand the reasoning and the purpose behind it is because everybody has to have some sort of you know finality and definition so whenever they're describing or discussing something, it just makes the just makes people's lives easier if you can just say, "Oh, it's this," and just saying, "Oh, well, it's kind of fucking everything." I don't know, you know that that yeah. just doesn't work for a lot of people. But if I had to describe Nevermore to somebody that never heard the band before, I'd probably be like, "Hey, you like metal? Yeah, 
stuck on Nevermore. <laughs> it's like literally all because there's there's gonna be something in there that they like. If they like the melodic kind of more ballady songs, you you have that. If you want the epic kind of power metal sweeping songs, you have that. Um, if you are a big Pantera fan and you like just really epic grooves, you got that. You got everything. Yeah, it's like whenever you go to Chili's and you're getting ready to order the appetizer, you're like, uh, I'll have the sampler platter. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's my encore. Or encore. It's not my encore. It's my, it's my entree. And then if I'm still hungry, it becomes my encore. You know? <laughs> Oh man, South uh, Southwestern egg rolls. I order I order a double portion of that, so they bring me the whole egg roll, <laughs> and they and they don't cut it in the middle. The, <laughs> dude, it was in the middle of the day a couple of weeks ago. I was at work and I was like dying, and I was like, I've got to have something to eat. So I, that's what I order. I door dash that from Chili's. <laughs> yeah. I had a hungry man <laughs> every fucking day this week. <laughs> I can oh, feel that, dude. It was anyway. awful. Well, before Jeff decides to feed his face from the microwave, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We're on Spotify, Apple and Google podcasts, tune in radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. I'm not going to tell you about them in general, but I'm going to read you one that we got this week that, uh, I mean, I, I kind of agree with, and I, maybe you guys will too. Uh, it's short and sweet. Five stars on Apple Podcasts from Brian Brawl who says more fun than punching a sleeping baby. Wow. So there you have it. Our podcast is more fun than committing a crime. I don't know. It depends on the baby. I was he a dickhead. All right. And Jeff, this is Jeff's last episode of the show. Uh, he's had a really good run. He's come back and everything. And, and now he's gone. So uh, there you go. sorry, bud. Got to go. Uh, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, though, speechless now after after that that vile vile comment from <laughs> mr unicorns and rainbows over there uh in all seriousness please keep liking and commenting and subscribing and leaving us reviews uh it helps us out uh as far as uh, as far as algorithms go i think i say i think because who really knows what algorithms are thinking probably just thinking about a bunch of numbers and doing a bunch of math that i personally couldn't do myself but uh you know if anything it makes us feel better it makes us feel like people are listening so uh Thank you guys so much for those, and we will continue to read those on the show. So, Dan, tell me about Nevermore. Who? Uh, let's see. Nevermore. Quote My the Raven. Uh, I'm not quoting the Raven. Uh, <laughs> Nevermore is a uh, is a metal band from Seattle. They've been around since 1991, and uh, unfortunately, uh, with the with the passing of their frontman uh, Warl Dane in 2017 we're probably not going to get any more evermore stuff unless it's like a tribute of some of some kind um which i would totally be down for because uh after spending a week listening to this band i feel like they need a tribute didn't they uh didn't a single get released i haven't listened to it but didn't a single get released like i don't think so i don't think so nothing new that i'm aware of jeff's all like we should start talking about singles on this podcast i know we don't talk about EPs, yeah, just go straight, singles to, straight yep. to singles. Straight to singles. Three hours of what you guys think of the new Nevermore track? So there was a single released this year called Fractured. Okay. Maybe I we'll haven't have to listened to this. But Maybe we'll have to do a reaction video to it. We're not doing reaction videos, dude. Oh, no, no. Uh, Dead meme. Fractured, Fractured is not. That's like a dance track. Oh, cool. Even better. I'm almost, I'm almost positive that that's a dance track. I told you that they play everything. <laughs> anyway, regardless, uh, the band is no longer around, but they they definitely left quite the uh, quite the lasting legacy, uh, releasing albums between 1995 and 2010. And I mean, they they were no slouch. This is this is some of the best stuff. Like I said, this is kind of a uh, kind of upper tier sometimes to to some of the stuff that we talk about on this show. And uh, I was very very blown away by the quality. So I can't I can't wait to get into this. 1995, never more. Never more. Dun, dun, oh, dun. So, I mean, right out of the gate on this record, I'm already pretty blown away. Uh, what Tomorrow Knows pops in, and it's heavy. It's it's heavy in that 
mid to late nineties sort of sort of way where everything wasn't wasn't in the mix so loud that you know it's like clipping everywhere. So if you have a good sound system and you, which I do, <laughs> whenever you put this in uh, and you blast it, I mean you can you can feel it. It's it's the closest I'm gonna get to seeing the band live as far as just feeling these notes ring out. And the first thought that came to my head whenever I got about six tracks into this thing was, oh my God, this is what I wanted Iced Earth to be. Like whenever I, like, like, cause I mean, you know, you guys have heard everything that we think about Iced Earth. Uh, but like, <laughs> I Well, there's like, a lot of, lot of negativity going around about Iced Earth for about the past, I don't know, nine months. Well, I'm not going to get into all that, but I do think <laughs> that, uh, you know. Uh, there is no more Iced Earth and yeah. there never will be. <laughs> Probably not. Um, <laughs> it's now his glorious burden. Anyway, um, <laughs> the uh, but what what bugs me, what bugged me about Ice Earth, and just is just we're gonna talk about anytime we mentioned Ice Earth, it's gonna be in a vacuum, as if like nothing happened, even though something it terrible happen. obviously obviously happened. But yeah, um, you know, in that context, I feel like both both of these bands, Ice Earth and Nevermore, kind of had the had the same goal, which is how can we be modern heavy metal. You know, and still and still pay tribute to the metal that we grew up listening to, while still sounding modern enough for 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 current music fans to enjoy enjoy our music. And I think Ice Earth did not accomplish that. I think that they just kind of gave up and went power metal, more traditional heavy metal overall. Whereas Nevermore on every record starts, you know, incorporating more, throwing more of those modern elements in, um, upping their production game. It's so funny going back and listening to this after I've listened to all the more modern stuff. Um, I was like, oh, wow, this sounds really dated. Like, it's good, but it, it definitely sounds the most old school um, because because it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, I was going to uh, say, uh, <laughs> Nevermore and the Politics of Ecstasy are, are both very rooted in power metal, especially vocally. You, you, you hear a lot more, you know, of those, the, the high falsetto vibrato, uh, you know, and the head voice vibrato stuff. There's a ton of that on, on the first two, and that really starts to dissipate. It's almost like it's almost like World Dane goes through puberty because as, yeah. <laughs> as time goes on, dude, it's got a badass, like badass baritone voice. Like I, I love he he has that's probably one of the most underrated aspects uh of this band, personally, because I'm such a big Jeff Loomis honk. I kind of forget about how good the progression and vocals became with world dane i mean he you know standard you know it was it started as you know fairly standard power metal you know with you know with some you know some harsh vocals and some vocal fry mixed in but as time went on the dude's just like you know what i can belt this shit out in a lower register i'm gonna fucking do it it's probably more comfortable for him yeah i think it, i think early it, on you're like is. oh you gotta go high pitch because that's the more metal thing to do right to go like higher and Almost in um, almost into a rasp, but you know. Well, and that's he, how yeah. that's how you have to use that. You have to use that rasp uh, to actually hit some of those high notes. Uh, as somebody who has a a voice that naturally resonates in a lower register, like he does. I mean, that's that's part of the trick. I mean, and that actually happens with a lot of metal vocalists, li- especially Absolutely. The, especially eighties and nineties metal vocalists. Listen to interviews with them. They all sound like they're fucking lurch when they're talking. <laughs> I'm serious. Like straight up. I mean, like one of my favorite ones was um, it's probably Phil Anselmo. I-, I can't remember which interview it was. I was watching. He's a robot now, man. Like, yeah, thank, the you, dude, thank you so much for having me on your show. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, he's always had a deep voice, but he, he's smoking. Yeah. <laughs> Even before then, I mean, I'm, I'm talking the 80s, you know, the, you know, the, the late 80s, early 90s when they hit the scene. I mean, the dude had such it, this booming baritone voice in, in interviews. I'm like, holy shit. How the fuck does he hit those high notes? And that's what it is. You know, it, it's there's a lot of training with, you know, falsetto and head voice to to make that work because that's the shit that used to sell. So guess what? That's what you're going to fucking sing. If you can't do it, then you ain't selling and you ain't going to be popular. That's right. just just the way that it is. But, you know, I. The, the first album is because I, I love these guys is is probably my least. Well, it's either my least favorite or second least favorite uh, of the albums in a world where Fear Factory exists. Thank you for that, Jeff. <laughs> I missed you, man. <laughs> I'm listening to too. this and I'm not hearing the big single. I'm not hearing the band that's trying to make an impact. 
it starts off with this long, very theatrical presentation. Like the driving force was, let's just be there and act like we've been there for the past 15 years. This sounds like a record that a band you know released. Like it's their next step. Not the first thing you've heard by this band. Because most popular heavy metal fans, which in 95, did they exist? Or would they admit they existed? They're not hearing the two or three minute song that's catching them off guard and making them want to sit and listen to the band and be a part of the pit. The energy's there. This is very laid back. It's very theatrical in its presentation. So they started off big and they really did stay there. It's not the best record, but I can hear where this came from. I hear the Queen. I hear the Iron Maiden. I hear the weird mix of heavy metal influences. And then it's 95, guys. We're going to just put out something that's epic, but we're not going to push it and make it so epic that no one will listen to it. This is going to catch on is the mindset I'm hearing. And I think it works really well, but it's going to get better. It's going to get really better as we go forward. Because technically, the way that we need to look at this first release is technically technically as a third release and a lot of and that's mainly because two of the members were part of sanctuary which that was a pretty big band so absolutely so you you have that progression because it's not like these are a bunch of freshmen coming in no these are transfer students i mean they know what the fuck's going on they know what to do since we're on youtube can i drop f-bombs you can do whatever you want dude okay good good because fuck <laughs> <laughs> therapy yeah well it well it's i mean yeah th- th- there is that part but yeah i mean the reason why they sound good and, su- and why they are um polished you know than what most you know freshman releases would be is because it's technically a third release when you start to look at it i mean because world dane and jim shepherd were part of sanctuary uh and that was kind of a you know big deal uh, Didn't their on, label just come out and be all like, you guys need to play grunge? Or so wasn't that what happened to Sanctuary? I don't know. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised because, hey, look, you're from Seattle. You'll get to play grunge. Yay! Yeah. No, I think that that was actually something that they had said in an interview that the that the, that the the record label was like, you guys need to go in like more of a grunge style. Because Sanctuary was a metal band, you know, like. Oh, yeah. They were power metal. A lot band. like, oh, yeah, a lot like Nevermore, you know, uh, or early Nevermore. Um, and basically they're like, yeah, okay, you want us to go grunge? Great. We quit. And then they went off and became Nevermore, you know? Yeah. Bravo. Yep. Bravo to them. And uh, I know that uh, World Dane and Jim Shepard were both chefs. Yeah. So, and, and one of them passed and the other one almost passed. I mean, like, there's some really bad juju <laughs> that happened to these to the guys that have been part of Nevermore. Yeah. I mean, there there is a crazy, crazy history of like bad shit that happened to people that were in this band, and it's really depressing. And they it's not it, should have just become Pearl Jam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, so so you're saying that that record producer went and uh, went down to the Caribbean and got himself a voodoo doctor? I hope not. That's disrespectful. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> How's that disrespectful? Uh, kidding. Anyway, uh, 1996, the politics of ecstasy. Yeah, this was a turd for me. Really? Yep, another turd. I think this the, only, the is... only the only thing. Wow. Sorry, the only thing that I loved about this was the learning. The learning's fucking epic. I like the sacrament. I like the sacraments. I like the seven tongues of God. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. But yeah, I just comparatively speaking it's not like it's bad I, I guess i should preface that turd statement it's a turd for nevermore okay it's not a it's not a turd in when it comes to metal because it's leaps and bounds better than a lot of the shit that we've talked about or that you guys have talked about than when i haven't been here is this the bottom of the barrel for nevermore for you yeah absolutely wow i mean the bottom has to be there somewhere and i don't agree this kicks off with riffs it's like they were trying to find their footing or they were trying to find out how much classic heavy metal can we sneak in here because the band overall is very laid back and theatrical, like I said on the last record. But this is another example of just pretend you guys have been here the whole time and eventually people will accept you 
as one of those big metal bands. And I like the way this kicks off. I like the way this moves forward. It's very reminiscent of the first album, but it sounds like someone was motivated to bring the pace up a little bit. Overall, it's the same, though. I mean, in my opinion, it's faster. It's heavier. The production's beefed up uh, quite a bit on this one. And uh, that's not just because I, you know, listened to the first album's original release and then I went and listened to the remaster of the politics of ecstasy or anything <laughs> like that. I have been known to do something that I'd be like, man, the production on this is banging better than it was on, <laughs> you know, than it was on the last album. Uh, but no, I actually made sure to pay attention to that on this one. And uh, but no, this is faster. This is heavier. It's more. It's more in your face. And uh, I mean, I was here for it, man. Um, I mean, I, I have I, to admit, the, the the albums that come after it definitely overshadow it. Uh, but this is. I, I thought this was killer. The sacrament. This sacrament. I've listened to like fourteen times this week. I kept coming back to it. It's just so heavy, man. In the midsection, like the two minutes 50, 55 second mark. This thing starts slamming hard. Yeah. Just to be fair. I know I'm in the minority on this. Like historically speaking, if you go through and read reviews that are on this album, like most of the people that know what the fuck they're talking about love this album. And I know that that's just I know I'm not I in, mean I, in the <laughs> but I'm I'm I'm, I'm talking about like <laughs> I'm talking about when you were still in diapers when this shit came out. You know, this dude, were you in diapers in ninety six? I hope not asking for a friend. <laughs> I've been in diapers since last month. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying that, you know, historically speaking, this has been a super popular album. And I know that I'm, I, whenever I give it, you know, like there's a scale of one to 10 when I, on the Nevermore scale, I give it a two and a half on the metal, you know, score. I'd probably give it a, a five or a six. So it's not like it's bad. I still think it's average or above average, but for Nevermore, it's bottom of the barrel. Do you see that door, Jeff? Yep. Get out of my house. <laughs> I got one right here. Here, here. here, let me try to get that for you. Uh, uh, yeah, good, good well, one there. Oh, couldn't work. Sorry, I'm stuck in here. I mean, obviously, you know, as we as we kind of, you know, as we as we attempt to move on here, this is kind of one of those things where, as much as I want to defend how great of an album it was, uh, you get to the next one. And um, let me just say, they uh, they they absolutely just kill it on uh, "Dreaming in Neon Black." 1999. I mean, the first thing for me really is just that like they didn't obviously change. I don't feel. I do feel like this is still kind of a natural progression, but it's like the point in every band's career where they grow the beard and they have this like really really good really great um, kind of kind of step up in quality. I felt like the songwriting on this record absolutely blew away my expectations based on what I'd heard on the first two records. Yeah, this this one, like from metal junkies that like the macabre, like this album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like there's like, do you guys know like the crazy, like the truck stop killer backstory to this album? No. Fill me in. Dude, like, yeah, one of the songs on here, World Dane's talking about an, an ex-girlfriend that just like, shh, cut him off completely like a hundred percent cut him off and he started like having nightmares about her and shit and like she's crying in his dreams and stuff like that and turns out that this ex-girlfriend and uh her husband were one of the people that were killed by the the truck stock killer i did not know that i did not yeah i have a completely yeah. different perspective on this album now that you that's said that to me yeah like it's totally like fucked up shit and that's like like people are like it's like you know flies to light when it comes to to this album it's like crazy scary like the dude like kind of like felt weird shit was going on and he was not aware that she had been murdered because she like got murdered in like 10 years or something like that before this album came out i, I don't remember exactly but i mean it, it was like years and then like it's almost like she was haunting his dreams it's really fucked up so yeah huh. I'm, it's crazy 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 shit but yeah this it's a concept album so you know i'm gonna like it I like concept concept albums. I, I think there's only been like one time on here that I said I didn't like a concept album. I can't remember which one that was, but I know I've said that one time and I think that's it. So I think I'm like 99% a fan of like every concept album that's ever come out. So yeah, it, it's definitely turning the page for them. They, uh, they realize that, Hey, we can do a lot of shit. And Jeff Loomis, this is when you really start to realize that this dude's a fucking visionary and, 
he is like the melting pot of metal. You know, just like, uh, you know, <laughs> you got the melting pot of America. No, Jeff Loomis is just the straight up melting pot of metal. Uh, his compositions, like, like just pull, start pulling from anything and everything that works. And he makes it work and makes it cohesive. Uh, and that's why I love the dude. And it's why I've been a big fan of his is because I, I could listen from here moving forward. Uh, this is when I really can just listen to Nevermore all day long. And, and Jeff is a happy Jeff. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, you're talking about melting pots. I'm just thinking about fondue now. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I I agree. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna stick your little uh, cocktail wiener in there uh, in that that cheese. I will. It's so good. It's huh. so good. You make your own dinner for a hundred bucks. And then whenever you take a bite, and the juices just go everywhere. Yes. This is the part of the discography where all of that pretending that they've been around for a long time pays off the form and feel of what a Nevermore record is, is perfectly utilized here. It's a little bit epic. It's groovy. It's heavy. The subject matter clearly was dark, and that drove the feeling of the album and the atmosphere. But now I'm listening to Nevermore. I'm not hearing a band that's trying to introduce me to a new style because that's really what they were doing on the previous albums in 95 how many bands were just playing heavy grooves and singing with theatric intent like they were telling a story the whole time this is a record where they are clearly telling a story and it works it's almost perfect i wouldn't say it's a perfect album but for nevermore it's the defining album for me yeah, you know what the funny thing is, the, the, this was not a critic, a critic's darling. That, that's the that's I'm surprised. the. Yeah, and I think it's because it uh, it started encompassing so much, and it was a concept album on top of encompassing so much. That's not a you know that's that's a pretty big you know horse tranquilizing pill to swallow, it, it, and that you know not everybody can do that. It, so yeah, there's there's a lot to uh, unfold really starting here and moving forward. Uh, where there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of things that it, you can go back and listen to that you missed the first time around. That's really when it starts happening is it is here. So uh, like, I I don't know. Dreaming in Neon Black is kind of like where they really find their footing for me. Uh, and they, it's, they and seem that's to when, love it. Yeah. Yeah. Th th this is really when I think Nevermore really becomes the Nevermore that, that I like. Uh, and yeah, I, I have I have zero complaints on this album. Well, they call it they call back to it too on a later album where he's all like, so he says something about like he's like uh, dreaming in neon black, checking in or something like that, uh, which was Crown really control cheesy, to Major but, Tom. But I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, well, the I, talking about cool on this album on uh, Orphidian, you know the uh, the um, instrumental intro. You're uh, sam sampling one of my my favorite Scott Bakula movies. Oh, I mean, Clive Barker movies slash Scott Bakula movies because it was trash, <laughs> but, I, but I still fucking loved it. A trash movie is great for heavy metal album quotes. <laughs> yeah, well, guess what? I wanted when I remember when Lord of Illusions came out, I wanted it to be so fucking awesome. And it was one of the biggest letdowns of my childhood movie wise because I love the in flames of your childhood movies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know I was supposed you know I was supposed to go see uh, In Flames here in a, in a handful of weeks. Cool, bro. And I don't get to. Oh no! Uh, Why are you doing that to yourself? <laughs> yeah, because it's on my bucket list. That I mean, you seriously, wanna, you want to hear him play bad Clayman songs? <sighs> yeah, you know how they say never meet your idols. You're right. I probably shouldn't, but all these years, you know, even though I can't stand the current music, I love them so much. Now I had an opportunity to see them. I actually got fifth row tickets, you know, because it, it Megadeth show. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I paid out the nose to, to, to sit really fucking close because, you know, they were kind of like a, a high school childhood hero for me. I mean, they, they really were. I mean, they're one of the big things that really cemented my love for metal was in flames. So, yeah. But yeah, it, 
Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, going back to the whole, whole Lord of Illusions thing. Yeah. It was never, <laughs> never me or idols. I mean, cause I, two of my favorites working together and it ended up being a big old stinking, stinking pile of shit, but <laughs> hey, I, I still love that stinking pile of shit, even though it's, it's awful. It's better now because it, it's kind of, you know, cheesy, you know, but back then they was like really trying to be serious and it, it sucked anyway. So uh, Sorry. Nevermore, uh, <laughs> Nevermore Gee, is the band we're talking about this he, week. Uh, goes on a tangent, doesn't let anybody pull him back in. I made a comment. <laughs> 2000, dead heart in a dead world. All right, Jeff, just go. Uh, it's in my top 10 of all time. Fucking, fucking love this album. It is, well, number one, I should, I should, uh, Queens are right, one of my favorites. So that's because of the name for sure. Uh, yeah, it, no, not really. But anyway, it's maybe because there's another guy in the in Queens, right? With actually spells Jeff correctly. <laughs> that <laughs> might like, be it. Like giraffe spells like giraffe, right? Yeah. Yeah. Jeff Tate. If anybody who's wondering, but I love that vocal style. Uh, it's kind of more operatic and uh, there's there's more of a There's a fuller tone to it. And uh, it's really, really powerful. Uh, you know, a lot of modern day metal, there's, a, you know, the, when you get to the cleans, they, they, they sound like they're 12 year old boys going through puberty. And this time we got we got a big ass fucking linebacker of a man sound. You know, it, it's like Terry Crews is singing. I mean, you're like, fuck, <laughs> <laughs> this guy's got. Yeah, there's some there's some oomph behind this. The, the vocal, the vocalizations that's going on here. So, yeah, I, I loved it. Dead Heart and Dead World, hands down my favorite of theirs. I mean, and it's not even close. Even with the god awful cover, this is still hands down my favorite album of theirs. And God was that cover. I mean, it's just, not that it, bad. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> guys, that's not the cover I'm talking about, and you know it. What are you talking about? He's in no. denial. It's okay, Jeff. Are you talking about the Sound of Silence, the completely, uh, <laughs> the completely original <laughs> Nevermore song that just happened to share the same name and lyrics as, as a Simon and Garfunkel song. Yeah. It, that one. Yeah. Like, like, like dance, Dan had mentioned, uh, I don't know when, but he had mentioned that, uh, it was like, they had like Jeff Loomis came up with a, had like this extra song and world Dane hadn't written lyrics yet. He's like, fuck it. <laughs> I, I, I got the he's CD. Like, he's like taking a shit and he's like listening to Simon and Garfunkel. On his headphones <laughs> and he's just like, you know what? Well, I don't care what they wrote. I'm singing <laughs> the sound of silence over this. Over the I'm top, gonna do my yep. evil nevermore voice. <laughs> uh, outside of that, dude, I mean, this is the shit everywhere. This is the part of the discography <laughs> where the fear factory comparisons are easiest for me. It's the year 2000. You have a heavy groove driven band with melodic baritone vocals semitones separated apart we always have that harmony thing going on i really like it it might be the best album in the discography but overall i'm not hearing a different band i think in this case it's okay it's fine for nevermore to keep doing what nevermore does this is in the year 2000 the most recent example of what that is and it's the best example. So here we are. Jeff would say we're at the top of the mountain. Maybe we are. But it's a good place to be if you just got into Nevermore at a time when grunge was either a bad word or new metal was a bad word. Either way, you've got some heavy metal to lean back on with this band. Yeah, this is about the time that people start saying, oh, yeah, they're progressive metal. Yeah, and I disagree. Well, I'm, uh, I I agree, but I'm just saying that's because this is when you really start seeing that. I'm gonna take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I'm gonna just put it all in a bowl and mix it all up, and boom, here's some fucking awesome metal. Well, I mean, they are chefs, uh, so <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. But uh, you know, Good unlike one. you, unlike you guys, I am not on the mountain. I am in the river. What the fuck? I'm in the river because there's a dragon in the river oh. and um, he got really, really, really excited about something. So the river dragon has come. Uh, okay. And I think that like, I think this is the definitive song on this record. 
because it shows that Nevermore is not afraid to be playful. And I can't help but feel like they're making fun of power metal bands a little bit here. Like, like they've gotten over the, they've gotten over the whole power metal thing. So they're like, now we're going to write a song about a dragon, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know. I thought this was, I thought this was super, super fun. And I, again, this is, this is such a, such a, a, a tear jump uh, for the band as far as, and, and I, my, can I, can I say that this record sounds not to steal a page out of Joe's book, but sounds sonically perfect uh, for what it is. It's, it's the best mix. It's the best. I mean, it, it's made in 2000. It's a little bit before the noise wars. You, you don't have, you know, Andy Sneap just came in here and just made this thing absolutely shine and i love it i love it jeff immediately pulls his phone out he's like did andy sneep do this <laughs> <laughs> yes he did i saw the little i saw the little wheels turning in that head in that head of yours no i went to get my water all right uh-huh yeah anyway this record's killer this, i mean this band guys we're, we're this many albums in and like we're really having to grasp at straws to find anything negative to say. And that's really refreshing, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, this one is, um, I don't know. There's probably 120 albums in my top 10. <laughs> but if I really think if I had to parse it down, I'd be really hard pressed to remove this one. So that, that's just how I feel. Uh, I think everybody knows I love the whole melting pot of using a bunch of different shit and in, in, in metal on your albums so i mean it's one of the reasons why i'm a big you know loomis fan as i've said previously but this is i don't know it, like if i if somebody came up to me and they they said hey i want to listen to metal i i think this might be one of the albums i give because it touches on so many things uh musically you know sonically speaking so they would kind of get like a really good introduction to a lot of different styles uh, that they could kind of pull from here to see what it is that um, that they're interested in the most. I mean, you, you could be straight up metalhead like the three of us and say, I fucking love it all, you know, warts and all. Uh, but some people are, you know, could be really particular and you could say, hey, you know, I like this sound, you know, on, you know, on this portion of this song. And I say, oh, well, that's, you know, this and here's what you ought to check out. And there's a lot of that all going on on this album. And that's that's what's I think what's cool about it is that uh, it, they did such a good job of taking all of that to, and, and mixing it together and making it sound like it belongs. I mean, we've we've heard plenty of, you know, metal where we're like, I mean, I know that they're trying to be unique, but why the fuck did they put that in there? Well, where'd that saxophone come from? Yeah, like <laughs> looking at you, bloody incantation. I'm just kidding. I love you guys. <laughs> Dan really does not like the saxophone. But but that's kind of my point is that there's a lot of bands, whether you like them, you know, collectively or not. Sometimes you they, you have stuff and you just kind of scratch your head and you're like, uh, OK, I, I mean, you guys are cool. And, you know, that, you know, that's that's neat, but it doesn't really fit. And that's what makes this album, I think. Uh, really, really, really special is that everything seems to fit and has a purpose and it, you know, it fits well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I love it. It's the reason why I'm happy to, to be on this episode. And uh, this shit is where it's at, man. I don't know what else to say. I think modern ears would call this band progressive because they understand music composition and know when to use diminished triads in their guitar solos. It's like they sat down and recorded the music that they wrote and they put time into it and didn't just play heavy for the sake of playing heavy. Just because you understand a diminished triad doesn't make you a progressive band. It makes you a good player. It makes you a above average musician in the year 2000, especially in heavy metal. Because what did we have? We had new metal, we had dissonant hardcore going on over here and we had leftovers from grunge it was an interesting time in the year 2000 but here's nevermore playing well above the curve when it comes to heavy metal and setting the standard that would be easily imitated by other bands i've mentioned fear factory a few times they're in the same ballpark but they are by no means the same band Burton C. Bell cannot sing anywhere close to this good. Anyway, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't hold it in anymore, man. I just, like, it was just, it had to come out at some point. 2003, Enemies of Reality. 
Who's or hungry we, after seeing that visual? I was going to say 2003, or do we mean 2005? I don't even know what year this oh, album I, came out. I mean, are we listening to the remaster that came out two years after the original? Yes, we are. So they had a pop producer uh, come in and, uh, and, and, and fuck it up, steer the helm for this record. <laughs> So what you have, what you have with Enemies of Reality is a balls heavy Nevermore record. Not all that much, not not all that much worse than the than the last one. Um, I think it's actually really really good. The the material is, but the way that original release sounds, they just took it and just cut all the balls out of it that that, that they could, to the point where I two years later Andy Sneap had to go in and fix it. <laughs> Yeah, like, so let's take some time out to thank Andy Sneap for putting his hands on everything, but especially this album because this one's for you, buddy. The remaster, it's it's way better, dude. Thanks, thanks for fixing yeah, it. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, I understand the logical progression to, uh, for for having Kelly Gray you know, do this album. Uh, it's you know, you know, friends and worked with and is actually in Jeff Tate's band, so. That's the I think I mean, I don't know the backstory, but, you know, if, if I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, vocally speaking, I, I have a, a I can produce that baritone vibrato, you know, with that that huge amount of power, just like Jeff Tate can. The difference is Jeff Tate's got a much larger range than World right. Dana ever had. I mean, I, let's make that I want to make that clear. I mean, you cannot compare completely World Dane to Jeff Tate. Jeff Tate is the far superior vocalist to almost any human being on the face of the earth okay so number one we'll get that out of the way but it's i think that was the reason why there was that original uh you know idea behind you know you know having kelly gray do the do the album and i understand you know if you know in hindsight's 2020 of course you know and then you realize yep that wasn't a good idea but at the time if i was with them i could see it you're like okay yeah i understand it you know they've worked with candle blocks and shit like that and that's another person who's got that 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 you know high baritone full voice register you know belting shit out so i can understand why they went that route uh you know vocally speaking but sonically speaking it was just a massive turd and uh un it's unfortunate you know shit like that happens you know there was i know there was a lot of controversy when it came out it was it was panned left and right and uh, that it sounded like shit and like dan said essentially it just cut off their balls i mean there was no oomph in the original and that's why i say 2005 because i you know andy sneep just put back what needed to be there for a metal album so yeah i i get it i understand it i i think it, you know looking back i wish they would have never have done it and uh they know that the 2005 version is heads and shoulders better sonically speaking so it, it was this one because of that it, it kind of gets an eh to me it you know just because I I list, I've I've heard both versions and uh, <laughs> it, it's like two different albums. It really is. Uh, just you know, quality wise, uh, especially if you have a very you know autophile ear and you have very large you know either good headphones or you know large sound system. Very at home. large what, Jeff? <laughs> Medulla oblongata. <laughs> I don't there know. <laughs> <laughs> I have had trouble swallowing lately. Anyway. <laughs> No, that that was a uh, Waterboy reference. Yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, part yeah, of your brain, I, buddy. I thought this record was absolutely like good, but not yeah, great. Yeah, man, it, it's just good. It's 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 the it's the follow up that is acceptable after the magnum opus that was just dropped. Yeah, and that that's hard, you know, because it's like if it was the first album I ever heard by Nevermore, I'd be all like, dude, Ace is across the board. Let's go. <laughs> you know, it, it, uh, Ace is high, right? Uh, but uh, Power Slave, it's the best Iron Maiden album. Uh, but the, uh, the yeah, I, I just I loved it. I loved the I loved the more modern cover artwork. I will say though, speaking of Iron Maiden, that Nevermore is kind of bad about having way more brutal of cover artwork than what their band actually is, um, <laughs> especially on this record. I mean, you got a you got a skull with worms in the mouth coming out of the skull cap and all this stuff or whatever and i'm like oh my god like is this gonna be like a bloodbath record like i'm not like not really sure what i'm prepared for but luckily you know we know nevermore and i gotta say they didn't slouch in the heaviness department and once andy sneep came in and ma he waved his magical wand all over it i mean it was absolutely what it needed to be um it was really it was good not great 
And um, I think that whenever this godless endeavor came out, I think it more or less kind of put the band back on track, in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. 2005. Here we go again. It's an upbeat, groovy, nevermore record with some epic vocals and theatric presentation. Does anybody else have anything to say? <laughs> that little girl on the cover looks pissed off. I've got I've, my kids have looked at me like that before. Uh, it is not. Uh, I'm usually it's not a good time uh, after you after you see that look coming from somebody so young. Um, but yeah, I I love that I love that the record starts in a thra- in a straight like thrash groove, like just a straight thrash. Like duh, 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 duh. this thing hits so hard. There's no more like yeah, we're gonna let somebody come in and take the power out of this. Look, we're we're gonna go. We're gonna give you guys all the modern heaviness that all these like young kids that just heard at the gates have been out doing. Now we're gonna give you that level of. We're gonna give you that type of production, and you're gonna start realizing there's a huge difference between our heavy riffs and whatever all these other metalcore bands are out there playing that are that they think is heavy. This is so heavy to me. That the first track, Born. Oh my God, so heavy. Like, and again, I'm always waiting for Nevermore to break the veil vocally and just go right into the growl. I'm always waiting for it to happen. It never happens, but I, I had to listen to the whole record anyway. So that's how they get you, you know, <laughs> to, see, to see if it's going to happen. And I'm not like upset that it didn't, you know, obviously um, there's different types of talent in metal. And, and this is just one of those, like, why would I growl when I could do this? You know? Um, Absolutely. But yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, man. This is number two on my products, list. Oof. Yeah. It's yeah. number which one? I'm sorry. I was talking over you. No, that's okay. Like an it's, asshole. No, I kind of interrupted Jay. It's number two on my list. I, I really, really like this. I, I don't know. Whatever reason, it just kind of it, it hits me right. Uh, I think, I don't know. I think if if Enemies of Reality had uh, didn't have that, um, that faux pas, it m- might be number two. But that's kind of yeah. like a... I, I lived through that stain, so it was kind of hard for me to, you know, come back from that 100%. But yeah, this Godless Endeavor is is solid. It, it's it's what you want it to be. Uh, it, it is a good bordering on great. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like a, on the uh, on the Nevermore scale, it's like a seven and a half or an eight, which is really fucking good because that puts it like a nine on metal on all other metal, you know, track, you know, one to ten rankings. They're so consistent, it's hard to dig into it and find the low point. Even though you can pick an album and say it's not my favorite, overall, the band is solid. Misstep in 2003, maybe, but they fixed it. So here we are. It's 2005. And I'm wondering if we're ready for the Obsidian Conspiracy in 2010. Oof. I am. And uh, that's mainly because I'm a massive fanboy of this producer and the band that he used to be a part of. And who so, is that producer, Jeff? Uh, Peter Wickers. He, uh, oh, that, I fucking love that the album cover on this one. It's fucking great, <laughs> dude. That's it's it's the shit. It's their best album cover in my opinion. But that's just me personally. But no, uh, stabbing the drama. One of my favorite albums of all time from Soil Work, and that's where Peter Wickers is from. Uh, he was one of the founding members of Soil Work, and I think we all know that I'm I'm a big fanboy of that band and have been for decades now. It's kind of weird that they've been around so long, but I love them. And uh, yeah, so it's definitely a different vibe, and uh, it's not necessarily you know for everybody, but I think it's really fucking good, personally. But hey, it's I, for me, man. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Sorry, Joe, go ahead, my friend. I waited till the end of this discography. It took me till the end of this discography to figure out why I love this band so much. And it's the King Diamond influence, guys. It's the joy that I'm hearing in his voice. Dude's baritone, but he does those ridiculous harmonies and does not let up. So here you have a heavy metal band, which is 80s influenced. We mentioned the similarities between Fear Factory and this band, but that wasn't it. I couldn't figure it out. And then once I got to this record, it clicked. There's Merciful Fate in this. There's King Diamond in this. And that's a combination I don't think we've ever talked about. We've never broken down a band and say, clearly, they have the same influences from Iron Maiden as they do from King Diamond. But here we have this dark 
sounding band who presents these pictures, these complete ideas, dare I say atmosphere, Jeff, that gives you a full listening experience, but they never break into the trope. Dan mentioned the growl. They never go there. Effectively, they've been doing the same thing for 15 years. It just sounds better, purely cosmetically. Well, this I will say this uh, on this album. Uh, the reason why it's not 60 minutes and it's 45 minutes is because uh, Peter Wickers wanted Jeff Loomis to uh, be a little bit more straightforward. Uh, a, this is probably their least complex release in a decade. I think you have to go back to the first two albums to find something this simplistic. Uh, it actually, it might be their most simplistic album overall, and that was by design. They were looking for something just a little bit more straightforward and, and uh, dare I say it, almost radio friendly. Uh, you know, if we were in Phoenix, where they actually play metal on the radio, unlike St. Louis. But yeah, I mean, it's it is definitely a uh, it's a change of pace, and I think that's I'm okay with it here. I think it's pretty cool that Jeff Loomis is, was willing to allow a contemporary because, I mean, they're the same age, uh, do the same thing. They're both lead guitarists, you know, both do a lot of production work. They know what the hell's going on. And he had the humil humility to listen uh, and, and take direction uh, from a peer. And I, I think that's I think that's pretty fucking awesome on its own. I mean, in, in any industry, let alone one where there's huge egos, you know, I'm not saying that these guys have egos, but typically speaking, you kind of, you, you take the music industry or, you know, acting and you just assume they have egos. And the fact that none of that got uh, in the way of the process. And even if it did, they still got through it. I, I think it's pretty fucking cool. Um, I don't know. It, it's definitely a different feel. Uh, uh, but it's one that I like uh, and that I'm okay with. Uh, I, I, it's kind of, it kind of sucks that we never got to get anything else after this. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it is what it is. You know, unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, death comes for us all. And, uh, and that, that was really what, what happened here. Uh, uh, and it is pretty sad because, you know, world Dane, it, it was, you know, even though he was in his fifties, I mean, dude was starting to become pretty prolific and a lot of people wanted him because of that amazing, you know, baritone voice. Uh, and he was a lot easier to work with than Jeff Tate. <laughs> 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 Shit. I think anybody's easier to work with than Jeff Tate, but probably. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, talking yeah, about, I definitely, talking about egos. I definitely enjoyed the stripped down nature of it. I'm not going to lie. You guys know that I'm not like the biggest fan of Prague. And if I am, there's like four bands that I like that, that are that way. And I'm not saying that Nevermore was prog, but like my biggest complaint about Never Nevermore as a kid was like, man, this song's eight never minutes gonna, long, never gonna end, you know. <laughs> and then I heard Dream Theater and realized how how lucky I was to be, <laughs> to be listening to Nevermore, right? Um, you know, I wouldn't bat my eye at a six at a six minute song now, but like back then, you know. But I, I like it. I like that every song's about four minutes long, maybe five. You know, um, it's just it's sometimes good to hear a stripped down version of a band without all of the excess and that that was kind of what attracted me to it because like and it's not just a timing thing where it's like oh, i gotta get through another album by this band oh thank god it's not an hour and seven minutes long you know th there's maybe a little bit of that in there but uh but for me um i thought that this was a i think it's cool that you can break a band like nevermore down to kind of their mo most essential parts and it's still good and it's still it still ev evokes that that same emotion that you feel when you're listening to the more complex stuff i think that the more complex stuff you appreciate less unless you have like a um if you have a more stripped down counterpart to balance it out it's like two really good pieces of a puzzle i don't know i i really i thought this was a really great record to end the end the discography on it's certainly not their best, but it's certainly not their worst. And I, uh, I, f I found pretty much all of these records enjoyable to some degree. And it's been a really long time since I've experienced that on the show. I think it's time for final thoughts on Nevermore. Dan. I mean, I, I said this earlier, but like this band is a higher tier than what we're used to talking about on the show. It's not that the other bands we talk about all suck. I mean, some of them do. Uh, <laughs> we'll tell you all about it, but uh, you know, these guys just were so professional. I like, I haven't felt I out of nowhere with no preparation and no being like really kind of coached about it ahead of time. 
I suddenly started feeling like I was talking about like an Opeth level band or like a uh, Dream Theater level band, you know? And so everything they did was always so professional and it was so intense and in your face. And um, and they just they never let up and they just got better and better as they went on. So like Nevermore is a band that if you heard a song by them a long time ago and didn't, didn't dig it, maybe you should give them another chance. That's what I did. And I'm really glad that I did that. Jeff, what about you? I, I think I've made it pretty clear throughout this that uh, musically speaking, uh, compositionally speaking, that I, I'm a huge uh, nerd for uh, Jeff Loomis's work. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm going to like pretty much everything that has been in this discography. And yes, I tend to be ultra cr- critical of the first two releases, but that's also because uh, I knew w- what came after. Uh, but, I, you know, speaking in a um, mm, yummy with the burp there, uh, speaking with uh, collectively throughout all of the discography, I mean, it, it, it's it's hard to surpass these guys because they're so consistent and that's 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 something special uh it's can special you know really whenever you start considering how many different things that they that they encompass in their compositions uh that that's a that's pretty special you know they they can take those chances and we like what the chances are i mean and and the one chance that they fucked up on you know they're like yep we fucked up on that and we're gonna fix it I mean, how, how many bands are just like, you know, willing to to do that? Most bands are, you know, will, you know, put their foot down and, you know, and just say, you know, that's the best thing ever. You're going to like it. <laughs> I mean, since we're talking about in flames, you know, re- previously, <laughs> you guys wanted us to re-record five songs from Clay from Clayman badly, right? <laughs> that's what you guys wanted, right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, there you, you have that in it. World Dane is somebody that, since I don't have a high register when I'm singing, uh, mainly because I don't have a vocal range. I mean, I enjoy listening yeah, and listening to his music and singing along with it. So, oh shit, there's somebody at my front door. Can you guys hear that? You want to go <laughs> take care of that for me, Jeff? <laughs> no, I got kids here. <laughs> All right, then. I think Nevermore might be one of the best bands you can listen to if you're a fan of radio-friendly heavy metal and you want to take a little step outside and see what is out there in terms of interesting metal with solid musicianship, but not in the grind section of progressive metal. I think Between the Barrier to Me is great, but they might be too much for some people. I think Opeth is great, but they might be too much for some people. So if you've spent a good portion of your life listening to bands that are played on the radio and you're used to those three and four minute songs that they're interesting to listen to, but when you buy the record, you're not really satisfied, Nevermore might be a good way to spread your wings and listen to the more serious or the more legit heavy metal that's out there. They've got just enough of that theatrical feeling with solid progressive metal intent. Throw in those baritone vocals and some of the best musicianship you've heard. You're not going to fail with this band. When your best record is completely subjective and your worst record is still better than most of the bands you've ever heard on the radio, I think that means you need to listen to Nevermore. So everyone needs to go listen to Nevermore. They are th- that band that you've been missing. And I hate to say it, you probably have heard all of these tricks done by someone else. It's time to give credit where credit is due. So check out Nevermore. Damn, what's your album of the week? Well, you know, this was a this was a recommendation from the king of metal himself, uh, Mr. Lance Allegood. The king of metal. And if you guys want to know what my album of the week is, you might have to pull out a paper and pen to make sure you're ready. Uh, (laughs) This album is by a band called Chopping Mall. Uh, They are a death grind band, a one member death grind band, the best kind. And uh, this album is called Mauled by a Magical Bear with Scalding Hot Liquid Cheese Spraying from its Eye Sockets. And uh, yeah, so it's yeah, it's it's fantastic. You need wow, to that's fucking awesome. Yeah, he wasn't so, yeah. kidding. Shout out to the king of metal, indeed. I'm gonna go ahead and say that's my album of the week as well. Jeff, do you want to jump on this train, even though you haven't heard it yet? Nope, I'm gonna be an outlier. 
So we shouldn't be shocked about that. I am doing sleep token sundowning mainly because I'm very much looking forward to this place will become your tomb, which in, uh, shows up in the uh, end of September. And I'm super stoked about that. I am going to give him a shout out because uh, I started checking out Doug Helvering uh, as far as like uh, reaction videos. That dude is a uh, his his sonic ear is just insane and what that guy can pick out uh, and he breaks down some of the favorite stuff that that I love like he did a um, he did a Nutshell by Alice in Chains which is one of my all time favorite songs and I highly recommend checking out that that you know that uh, breakdown of Nutshell and uh, just the sim- how simplistic and how beautiful but how uh, technical it is all at the same time uh, I think he does a really good job of explaining that. So, yeah, I will give him a shout out on that, too. And you know what? You know how we we know all those things from the uh, from the metal God himself is because Patreon hangouts, y'all. Patreon hangouts. They happen once a month. We hang out with you just like this, like we're all hanging out right now, <laughs> except 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 you're there. Yes. And I That's highly nice. recommend it because it's it's actually a lot of fun. And I tell you what, you we're just three dudes like whenever there's a bunch of people on telling us a bunch of shit you know it's not like we know everything it's so cool being able to hear new I mean, shit speak for yourself <laughs> well, okay. so we got we got mr asshole you know over here and then oh, i'm just talking about mr. joe i don't know everything oh, oh okay <laughs> <laughs> but no i i love being able to pick people's brains and and uh kind of discover new things you know whether it's metal or or not it's just it's super fun and that's a you know I've I've only been on two of them myself personally, but uh, I've 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 come away with a, a lot of new information that I never had before because of them. And can we just take a minute to say how happy we are to have Joe? Or not? Well, we always have Joe, uh, <laughs> but to have Jeff back on the show for this episode, and yeah. uh, I believe I believe more episodes uh, in the future. Oh, are are you letting the cat out of the bag, huh? Yeah, man. Uh, we're gonna have Jeff. Uh, you know, more often than we did before. I don't know about every episode, but uh, yeah, I don't know about every episode. Slowly pulling him back into the swimming pool. So, yeah, so I I had a career change. Uh, I no longer have to do 70 to sometimes almost 100 hours a week. I actually get to have a life now. I actually get to listen to music again. Uh, It kind of put me in a dark spot in my life personally as well because all I did was wake up, go to work, come home, go to sleep, do it all over again and not seeing the sun the entire fucking time. And this is in the middle of summer and still not seeing the sun. Yeah. And then us making making you feel worse because like I'm texting you being all like, dude, you should come back on the show. People love you. They're asking for you to come back. We're talking about and, never yeah, more this week. Yeah, like let's, you know, and and so Jeff's like, wow, wow. I, you know, I felt bad before. Now I feel even worse. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. It, I, 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 as long as they will have me, I'm going to uh, put all the rumors to rest. Though, because you know, Dan hates me and everything, but I'm still on the, uh, I'm still here. <laughs> no, it, we. It, here's the thing that a lot of people don't get to see behind the scenes it, is the three of us. We talk pretty much every fucking day, and then it's been that way for years. Just because, you know, my life changed and I had to work some crazy hours didn't mean that I still didn't make time, you know, for Dan and Joe and vice versa. I mean, it just meant that I didn't get to be on the podcast because, well, sometimes life happens and you kind of have to take care of that shit. And that's where I was at. You know, you know, I know that every everybody's going to be at that point in their life if they haven't been there or they have been there and they can understand. So, you know, that's all that it was. And, you know, thankfully, there's, you know, there's been some really cool people that uh, have been on the show besides Dan and Joe and myself. So, you know, and we still like I I still talk to Chris every day, too, uh, for an example. I mean, like we're a we're a big family and uh, we take care of each other and uh, we don't try to there's there's not bad blood. Anybody who's been on this podcast, we love like family and we mean that. Uh, Otherwise, we they never would have. You know, Dan and Joe wouldn't have them on. I mean, let, let's let's we'll be clear about that. We we love everybody that's here, and everybody's you know got a different background, but that doesn't mean that we don't love them. Well said. Take us out, DFT. If you guys have ever been listening to or watching this podcast or having it tabulated to you via Morse code, uh, you know you've always wanted 
us to talk about a band that you pick. There's a lot of different ways you could reach out to us to give us those suggestions or to give us feedback. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. You can follow us on Instagram at Discuss Metal. You can send us an email at show at gmail.com. Uh, you may have noticed that we have uh, new logos that we've been using for the podcast. And uh, so if you want those logos on a T-shirt, you know, let us know. And uh, if you want the classic logo on a T-shirt, let us know because we do have a Teespring store set up and that old logo is about to go away forever. So if you want the classic discography discussion logo, check out the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our Teespring store. And uh, of course, you can always talk to us directly on Discord. There's a link on in the show notes that'll take you to our Discord server uh, where we are hanging out all the time as well as a lot of you guys. So uh, we can't wait to do the show again uh with jeff and uh we will see you guys next time and on that note this has been episode 238 of discography discussion thank you for listening you can like us on facebook and follow us on twitter at discuss metal subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts including google play apple podcasts and stitcher visit discussmetal.com for all things discography discussion and please send questions and comments to dan and joe show at gmail.com if you are not a patron you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal we have some sweet perks give me your money one dollar a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. 